Welcome, fifth graders, to the first ever virtual field trip for fifth grade at the STEM Environmental Education Center. I'd like to give a special welcome to the students at Alex Sanger Elementary, uh, Kleberg, John Neely Bryan, MB Henderson, and Anne Frank Elementary. Uh, thank you all for registering ahead of time for this field trip. We're glad to have you with us and excited to, to uh, explore physical properties of matter with you all today. If you have not registered for this field trip yet, you can still do so by going to www.tiny.cc slash EEC register to get yourself or your class registered for this field trip. Uh, like I mentioned earlier, today's field trip is going to be about physical properties of matter. During this virtual field trip, students will discover that matter has measurable physical properties, and those properties determine how matter is classified, changed, and used. Today, we are going to explore the property of solubility. We're going to classify matter as a solid, liquid, or gas. We're going to explore matter's ability to float or sink in water, which is also known as relative density. We're going to explore magnetism and matter's ability to conduct or insulate thermal energy. And while we do these investigations, we're going to use some tools. The tools that you're going to see today are a beaker, a triple beam balance, and a magnet. While you're watching these investigations, you can ask us questions, uh, but you need to do that by going to www.tiny.cc slash EEC dash question dash answer and fill out a short form to ask us questions and we will answer them um, throughout this afternoon's field trip. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Monroe, who's going to get us started with physical properties of matter. Good afternoon, fifth graders. My name is Mr. Monroe, and I'm going to be uh, conducting a field investigation using a magnet as a tool today. And students, before we get started in our investigation, I want to remind you of some things maybe you have forgotten over the summer, but let's go back and talk about matter just for a minute. Turn the camera on. It's on. Uh, matter is anything that takes up space, okay? Also, when we talk about the properties of matter, we're talking about things that, well, when we look at them, we look and see how they look, they feel, and also how they act. And that's basically what we're going to be looking at today. Yeah, well, I can, I can see and hear you just fine, Mr. Monroe. Okay, he, he can see me. All yeah. right, now, you know, talking about a magnet, we're talking about something that, you know, it's really kind of hard to figure out. We can't figure out who actually invented the magnet or who discovered it. And there are a lot of folk tales and stories about how the magnet came to be noticed. One such folk tale occurred in the mountains of Turkey, a country far away. Young shepherd boy was trying to rescue a lamb and he had just put on a new pair of sandals that had nails holding them together. And as he walked across this massive rock, his sandals stuck to it. Come to find out, the massive rock that he was stepping on was a natural substance found on our planet called magnetite. In other words, it's the simplest form of a magnet in the form of something called lodestone. And it can be found all over the world today. The closest locations where we can find lodestone to us is in the state of Arkansas and a little bit in Louisiana. Now, magnets have the ability to pull things to it, attract things. And so it depends on what those things are objects, what type of matter they're made of. And so a magnet can be used as a testable instrument. There are several common shapes of magnets. One, it's called a horseshoe. Another, a bar magnet. A third one is a ring magnet. And you know what? Every magnet has two ends or two sides to it. Take, for example, the horseshoe magnet. On this end, we see an S. 
On this end, we see an N. On the bar magnet, we see an S on this end, and we see an N on that end. And then on a ring magnet, we have probably the S on that side and the N on this side, okay? Those ends, where those marks are, that is where the strongest attractive force exists. Now, the thing about it, about those ends, for example, if we have an S on the end of this small bar magnet and an S on this end, and we try to put them together to see if they attract each other, they won't go together. They push against each other instead of attracting each other. That push against each other, we call that repelling. They are repelling each other, not coming together. But if I reverse it and I put it in next to the S, look what happens. They attract. Same way with the ring magnet. I put a ring on top of that, and we can see we cannot force it to go down. It's bouncing. There is a force in there that's causing them not to come together. They're repelling each other. So evidently, this is a S on this side and an S on this side. If I reverse it and put the N next to it going down, we see that they are trapped. Now, I know very well that you've heard the term North Pole and South Pole before. In fact, you probably heard it in geography, describing locations on our planet. If we look at the top part of our planet, that part right up there is called the North Pole. If we look at the bottom, that part is called the South Pole. Very similar to a magnet, okay? Now, students, I have some objects here that are made up of different mass. And I'm going to use one of these small bar magnets to do the testing with. They're very strong. I have a Petri dish here, and I'm going to put paper clip, another paper clip that has a little color to it, some staples, a screw, and another paper clip. And I'm going to see if those objects that are made up of that matter will be attracted to the magnet. Wow, look at that. They're all attracted to the magnet, okay? So that tells me that those items, those objects, in their matter, they must have a little bit of the metal iron in their makeup because iron is one of the most attracted metals to a magnet. And usually when that happens, they're attracted. There's a little bit of iron in that, that matter. I'm gonna take those off. And I'm gonna put some other items in there. This is another type of metal, it's lead. A brad, it's a little different color, so I wanted to test it out. I wanna see, it's kind of goldish in color. Then I have a paper or a plastic paper clip, a dime, a penny, which I know is made out of copper, and a popped top from a soda can, which I know is made out of aluminum. And let's see what happens this time. Whoop. Everything stays in the Petri dish and wasn't attracted to the magnet except the bread. So evidently, even though that's a different color, it's got iron somewhere in the makeup of its matter. I figured that the aluminum pop top from the soda can probably would not be attracted to a magnet, to the magnet. Now students, one common use for magnets not only to test the content or the how much a, a type of metal is in the matter, but different types. I can remember when I was a fourth or fifth grader growing up where I grew up, not very far from my house was a salvage yard. And in that salvage yard, it was just a junkyard. People would take all their old metal objects and probably they would take them there to, they would 
discard them or either they would sell them to the salvage yard because that was a place where metals were going to be recycled. And in the middle of the salvage yard, there was a crane, a very large crane. And hanging from the very top of that crane was a huge round magnet. And that magnet would be dropped among that junk and then it would be raised up and some of the metal would be picked up and some of it wouldn't. And I think they were using that to separate the different metals because some metals are not attracted to a magnet and some are. But you know, magnets are also used in something else. You ever get on a, you go on a hiking trip and you're kind of concerned about whether you're going to get lost or not. It's always advisable to take an instrument called a compass. And that compass may look something like this. And in the middle of that compass has got a needle or a dial. And that will move according to the direction you're going. And there's a reason for that. That needle is usually magnetized or it's a magnet. And it will be drawn to a certain direction. I have a real compass in my hand right here. And right now, the arrow is showing which way north is. Now, my classroom, I know which way north is from my classroom. And I can tell you, this compass is right on. Because it's showing me that north is that direction. And I know that is north. Now, also, I have a very large, or not large, but a homemade compass here that I have used a bar magnet. Suspended in the air by a ruler with a string holding on to it. And I'm going to stop it from spinning so much. And kind of let it work on its own a little bit. And it's going to find north for us. I can see it spinning just a little bit. It's trying to work its way. Spinning all the way around. I bet it's going to come back this way. Then it's going to come back that way. It's coming back this way. It's going to end up pointing the same direction the compass was pointing eventually because I can see it just, just about there. Hopefully today I have showed you how a magnet can be used as a tool to test other matter to see how it responds to magnetism, which can tell you what type of metal might be a makeup of that matter. Now, if you have any questions, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Broughton so he can answer those questions for you. I want to thank you for your time, and hopefully you've kind of learned a little bit about magnets. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Monroe. Uh, we did get a number of questions, uh, mostly from John Neely Bryan Elementary. Uh, I'm going to get to a couple of them right now, and we'll get to some more um, as we go along. So the first one is, do you have kids? And I will speak for myself. Uh, yes, I have two. Uh, I have a seventh grader and a fifth grader. So I will have uh, my fifth grade daughter watch this video probably when I get home today. And then the other video, or question, I'm sorry, is... Um, what is a horseshoe magnet? And if you kind of look at it like this, this is just a cord from a computer, but imagine if this were a magnet, a horseshoe magnet would just be bent like this. So a horseshoe magnet is just a bar magnet that they bent to make it the shape of a horseshoe, uh, which is just another way to use magnets. Um, it doesn't have to be bent, but they can bend them. All right, uh, we're gonna move along for our next physical property of matter with Mrs. Fuller. Hello, boys and girls. My name is Mrs. Fuller. Welcome to the Environmental Education Center. We're going to cover several topics during this segment. The first one we're going to cover is solubility. Solubility is the ability of a solid, a liquid, or a gas to dissolve in a solvent and uh, form a solution. So the, the, the substance that gets dissolved is called the solute. 
And the substance that does the dissolving is the solvent, usually a liquid, and it forms a solution, which is also usually a liquid, which, um, uh, which is simply two or more substances mixed together uh, to, to form a, a solution. So um, when, when we talk about solvents, the universal solvent is water, and it's because of the polarity of the water molecule. Now, I'm going to dissolve a substance in some water. This is halite. Halite is uh, sodium chloride. This is the way it occurs in nature. You might be more familiar with it as table salt. Uh, it's the same thing. It does, it's very water soluble. It dissolves very easily in water. So I'm going to demonstrate. Here is 200 milliliters of tap water. Here is 10 milliliters of halite or table salt. And we're going to stir it. The stirring action helps with the solubility, helps it dissolve faster. Another thing that will help salt, uh, halite, so, sodium chloride, uh, dissolve is to increase the temperature of the water. And it helps more um, dissolving, uh, helps the, the, the solute, the salt, dissolve faster. Now, that's not the case with all things that you can dissolve in water. I'm gonna show you another mineral. This is gypsum. Gypsum is also water soluble. And we grind it up and form plaster of Paris with it. But the difference between dissolving halite in water uh, and you can increase the solubility by increasing the temperature. If you increase the temperature when you make uh, plaster of Paris, it actually slows down the solubility and makes it less soluble. So remember, if you're going to make a, a mold of a footprint or a paw print or something like that, and you're going to use... Um, uh, plaster of Paris, do not heat the water. Keep it cold because it will dissolve more readily like that. The next uh, st um, property of matter we're going to look at is conduction. Now, conduction is simply the ability of a substance to um, transmit either electricity or heat. We're going to talk about both of those today. So um, what, what conducts electricity? All acids conduct electricity. Most metals conduct electricity. Um, uh, gold is probably the premier uh, metal conductor of electricity, but silver is, does an excellent job. Uh, but silver and gold are very pricey, and so our houses are not wired with silver and gold, but rather with copper. And uh, the copper does a very good job of conducting the electricity, allowing the tra uh, electricity to flow through it. Um, now, when we talk about conducting heat, heat, uh, you, you're familiar with making nachos in the oven, and you take them out and you put them on the tabletop, and you'll notice when you pick the pan up to go put it in the dishwasher that your tabletop has a warm circle where your pan was. The um, metal does a really good job of conducting heat, and the heat flows from the hot object to the cooler object. Now, we, after we've talked about conduction, how heat flows through things, how electricity flows through things, then we have to talk about insulation because some of these things, we want it flowing in one direction but not touching us. So let's talk about first about heat and cold. So we have some excellent con uh, insulators. Insulation just simply puts a barrier between whatever you're keeping hot and cold and the surroundings. So this is a little styrofoam box. I keep dry ice in this for a, a, a comet uh, demonstration. But it does an excellent job of keeping the cold inside the box and not on us. Um, another way of insulating in your house, your parents probably have those pink fiberglass bats in your attic or maybe cellulose. All of those things make excellent insulation for heat and cold. For electricity, it's a little bit more technical than that. I'm going to show you a, a wire, this copper wire. 
this the coppery part the metal part you see up there that's the thing that conducts the electricity this greenish yellow plastic around it is the insulator it keeps the electricity going through the wire from shorting out from burning us from electrocuting us it makes sure that whatever is plugged in works correctly so insulation with um with electricity is very very important and it won't work correctly unless it's insulated correctly so this is plastic also we use uh, things like rubber to um we got something here rubber to insulate wires so those are all good things i tell you Two things that make excellent insulators for electricity are ceramics and glass. If you've ever looked on the top of a utility pole, you might see these big ceramic devices up there. It keeps the electricity that's flowing through the power lines from uh, grounding, going down the utility poles and uh, losing electricity. So insulation is very important. I'm gonna show you very briefly this wire. This is a cable wire for cable TV. Can you see the copper part sticking out the middle? All those silver colored wires coming off the side are ground wires and they're made of aluminum. You don't want the two to touch. You don't want these aluminum wires to touch the copper wire. Um, so if you look right down the middle, you'll see that that copper wire has some white stuff all around it. That white stuff is insulation. It keeps the electricity from leaving the copper and going to the aluminum. Now, aluminum does, um, does uh, conduct electricity, it, but it's only about 61% as efficient as copper, but it's much, much lighter. It's only about 30% of the weight of copper. So you save a lot of money by not having a lot of weight. Aluminum is generally cheaper than copper. The problem is uh, it oxidizes. And if it oxidizes, that means it can spark and then it can burn your house down. So aluminum wiring is not as uh, a good of a conductor uh, as copper is. So thank you so much for this brief overview of uh, solubility, conduction, and insulation. I'm going to turn the rest of the questions over to Mr. Broughton. Have a good evening. All right, thank you, Mrs. Fuller. And we did have uh, one question um, from Mariana, which is why does halite look like ice? And uh, that's a very good observation that halite does look like ice. And I think, because I did not get a chance to look this up, but I think halite looks like ice because ice is crystallized water and halite is also a crystal it's it's um a salt which is a crystal so maybe since they're both crystals that's why they look similar all right we're going to move on to our next uh physical property of matter with miss nash great welcome welcome to my classroom today we're going to go we're going to talk about the three states of matter, three forms in which matter exists. And of course, those three forms are solid, liquid, and gas. We define a solid as having a definite shape and a definite volume, like my rock. We define a liquid as having a definite volume, but no definite shape. And we define a gas as having neither a definite shape nor a definite volume. It takes the shape and the volume of a container. In this case, my balloon. So I blew up the balloon, and the air that I blew in, the air being a mixture of gases, took the shape of the balloon. If I had blown more, it would have gotten bigger. So on our planet Earth, water is the only substance that exists naturally in those three states. So we have solid water, ice, it melts in the classroom here, became liquid water. I leave this, they all melt and I'll leave it a week or so. I'll come back and it'll be all gone. It will have evaporated. 
become part of the air in the classroom. In the meantime, however, hmm, it's all wet on the outside. And what's happening there is condensation. So water vapor in the air gets cold and he hits the outside of this cup bowl rather, and then it condenses. So evaporation, that word inside there, vapor, that means a gas. So water will evaporate, it will condense, it will freeze, okay? So you're just in those three states. Now, I've got a, a little demonstration for liquid taking the shape. So I've got three containers here of different shapes, all filled with liquid. And let's see, I've got my water bottle. Hmm, 200. This cool bottle and that cool maple syrup in it. Let's see, that's all gone. Hmm, 200 again. A big bowl, flat bowl here. That looks like more to me. But no, it's 200 again. Now this big tall one. What do you think? Yeah, you're right. It's 200 again. So all those different shapes actually had the same amount, same volume of water. Now gases. Gases are so interesting. And the thing about gases is they're, they're all around. The think about the three states. It's on the molecular level, on the tiny level. A, a solid, put your hand up like that. It's like that. Just there. Rigid. Doesn't move. But then if we add some heat to our, say our ice cube, it begins to melt. And they kind of loosen up begin flowing around and then if we heat them up even more and they start to vaporize then they have to go and move around and take up go escape get out of here but because they're mostly invisible it's kind of hard to kind of imagine what's going on are they really there How they? so i have a beaker here full of air and i put a balloon on top and then i'm going to see if i can get the balloon to go down in and i push I'm trying to try again. I'm trying blowing it. It won't. Why not? The air inside is pushing back. It doesn't have anywhere to go. It's trapped in here. But I pulled the gas. I took it. I took another beaker. And in this beaker, I put some steel wool, which has iron in it. And then I put a balloon on top. I'll put some water in there too, I forgot. Steel wool and water. And I put a balloon on top. And then overnight, the balloon went down inside the beaker. What happened? Well, some of that gas in there, the oxygen, ox the steel wool oxidized. Hear that word in there, oxygen? So the steel wool rushed. So you may see how rusty it is, all kind of red. And instead of being a gas like that, that oxygen became a solid. And then it took up less space. And when that happened, the balloon got pulled down inside. So we can do that same little experiment at home. We need a, some kind of a glass to do it and a bottle like that, a glass bottle. It needs to be a sturdy glass bottle. Put a balloon on top, put a steel balloon on the bottom first with water, and then a balloon on top. You can amaze your friends. The other cool thing about gases is that they are compressible in contrast to solid and liquid. Now I've got a bottle, a bottle here. I try to squeeze it. Just comes right back to the same shape. I take that lid off and squeeze really hard and then put the lid back on again. I've compressed it. Can you hear? So it just let us out. Fill it up again. We can use that property of gases for our own purposes. We can blow up the tire and compress the air and blow up the tires on our bicycle or the car. Those use compressed air. So it's kind of a unique property of gases.
And another place that we can find that is in our our soda bottle. We're going to take our fizzy bottle. I've got my solid, my liquid, and I've got gas in the top and maybe more. Did you hear that sound? So I shake it up a little bit. Oh, uh -oh. I don't want to get it on the computer. I've got bubbles in there, and those bubbles are carbon dioxide. And they're trying to escape, they're bubbling out. If I leave it overnight, and I come back and I go, oh, I didn't finish that. Then not taste right. All the fizz is gone. Where'd it go? It escaped into the room. And another little snack is our popcorn. So if I have a piece of popcorn, it's hard, Ugh. solid. But since it's a plant, I put it in a pan and heat it up. All of a sudden, I have popcorn exploding. What happened? Inside that kernel of corn, there's a little bit of liquid. And when it gets really hot, guess what? Like the Incredible Hulk, I just get out of there. And when it does, it rips apart the seed coat that's held it all in, and we get our yummy pop. And you can find other examples of this, this properties being used, okay? Um, in cakes and cookies and bread. See all the little holes in my in my cookie here? When the batter that made this cookie, it was just like a liquid, flour, sugar, milk. But then it baked, and as it baked, it puffed up. Hmm. Maybe you can investigate and figure out what was in that cake or cookie that made it puff up. And then when we cut it open, we have all these little holes there. What do you think was in the holes that made it puff up? And where did it go? Might be that. Here's another something I want you to think about. That sugar. And I can pour it just like I poured my blue water and it feels, takes the shape of the container. It pours, hmm, does that mean it's a liquid? It takes the shape of the container. Does that mean it's a liquid? Use your sensitive fingertips and feel it. Hmm. Now your hand lines are just your good young eyes. Hmm. And you should decide, is it really a liquid or not? Or could I make it into a liquid using what Mrs. Fuller just talked about? So see what you can do. Also, I'd like you to go around your house and since you're in fifth grade, I want you to find me five examples of each of the three states of effort. So five times three, that would be 15 things. Solids, liquids, and gases. And think about how we use them and how that the fact that they're either a solid, liquid, or gas is important for them to be useful. Thank you. And let's see if there are any questions. Uh, yes, we had one question, which is uh, you can compress air. Can you compress solids and liquids? And the answer is yes, a little bit, but also practically no, because um, they're already um, a solid or a liquid. You can you would have to take an, like a, a lot, a lot of pressure to compress them just a little bit. So they, it's it's the yes, you can just a little bit, but it's it's so such a little bit that it's practically no, you cannot compress solids and liquids. Because if, if you think about it too. To compress air, um, like in a bicycle pump, it gets hard to press that pump down when the when the tire is inflated. And if you compress a uh, compress air into a car tire, you need a machine to do that. So, um, just to compress air is difficult. So solids and liquids become very very difficult. All right, we're going to move on to our last physical property of the day with Mr. Ramirez. Hello, fifth grade. My name is Miss Ramirez, and in today's segment, we're going to be learning about the properties of matter of mass and also density. Uh, so to start off with, we'll start with mass. So mass is just the amount of matter that makes up an object. And how do you think we can measure mass? What tools might we use? Um, well, 
If you can actually hold the items, you can do a relative comparison of mass by seeing which one is heavier or lighter by feeling it. In lower grades, you probably used a science tool that looks like this. This is just a simple pan balance. And we're gonna use this one first because it's the quickest to use. Uh, we're gonna use this pan balance to compare the masses of our wax candle and our bead. Um, so make a prediction, which one do you think has more mass, the wax candle or the bead? and why, and we're gonna go ahead and test it really quick with our pan balance. I'm gonna put my bead on one end. I'm gonna put my wax candle on the other end. Make a prediction what's going to happen. So as you can see, the candle went down. So that means that the wax candle has more mass. It is heavier than our bead. So the side that goes down is heavier, the side that is up is lighter. So that's just a quick review from what you might have used in earlier grades. Also, you can also find an uh, estimate of the mass by using these little density cubes. These are pre-measured masses. So this one is at 50 grams and this one is at 20 grams. So you can experiment with these different weights to get a measurement of whatever you are measuring. We're going to do and look at another science tool that also measures mass. And this is a triple beam balance. Um, so we're just going to go over really quickly some of the parts and how it works, and then we'll talk about how mass relates to density. So here we have a box of iron pyrite. Iron pyrite is also known as fool's gold because it looks like real gold. It's nice and shiny, uh, but unfortunately it's not real gold. Um, but we're going to try and use our triple beam balance to get a mass reading. Hopefully you notice when I put it on that you saw this arm move up and down. The way the triple beam balance works, your goal is to move these sliding weights so that this black pointing arrow, it has a white line. You want this white line to be even with the zero mark. And the way you're gonna do that is you're gonna start experimenting by moving these sliding bars. You always start with the middle bar because it's the it has the biggest slider, so you would just move it back and forth and then after you experiment with moving the middle bar, you're gonna work your way to the back bar. This back bar, it measures in tens units. So you'll just experiment with moving that slider bar. And then you'll come over here to the front and move this smallest slider bar last. And again, your goal is just to keep moving these bars back and forth until that white line is equal to the zero. Now, once that happens, once you get it balanced, then you're going to have to read it. And this is a close-up of what those numbers look like on the balance. And here's an example. So if we look at our example, you're going to read the middle bar first. It is the largest one. And this one is in the hundreds. So if we look at our example, this one is at 500 grams. Then you're going to go to the back and read the, the last sliding bar. This one is in tens units. So this one is reading at 20. Then you're going to go to the front of the balance beam and read the smallest unit uh, sliding bar, which is in ones. Once you've read all three of those, you're going to put those numbers together. So we have 523.2 grams. Um, so that is how our triple beam balance works. Now, the reason we had to talk about mass first before we actually get into density is because density is how much matter or the mass there is in a certain volume. So density is simply the mass of an object divided by its volume. So what we're gonna do, so that you can visualize what all these words mean, we're gonna look at these two boxes. They both have iron pyrite in it. Uh, go ahead and think about how can we compare the masses of these objects? How can we describe the volume of these objects? And how can we describe the density of these two objects? So if I were, since I'm lucky enough that I can actually hold these, I can tell by holding them that this box has more mass because it's heavier. I can also tell by looking at them that this box is more dense. It has more matter inside of it compared to this one. Now, by looking at the two boxes, I also know that they have the same volume. So to find the volume of a box or a cube, all you have to do is multiply the length times the width times the height. But since they are in the same container, they have the same volume. So that's um, an example of what those vocabulary words mean. 
So what we're gonna do next, we're gonna look at a couple of items and we're gonna see whether or not they sink or float based upon their density. So as I show you an item, make a prediction whether you think it's gonna sink or float, and then maybe think about why. So we have an empty soda can, we have a piece of wood, we have a pumice stone, we have a limestone rock, we have an air-filled ping pong ball, and then we have our wax candle and our bead that we compared our masses with from before. So we're gonna move to the back table and we're gonna test to see whether or not these sink or float. And the science tool that we're gonna use for sinking or floating today is just a simple aquarium that's filled with water. And I'm gonna start off with our biggest items first. So we're gonna put in our Coke can. Again, you should have your predictions already. We're gonna put in our piece of wood. And right away, I'm noticing that our two biggest items are floating. So think about why is that? We also have our pumice stone. We have our air-filled ping pong ball, our wax candle, our limestone, and our bead. So did any of those objects surprise you as to why they are sinking or why they are floating? So let's look at the objects that are floating. So the objects that are floating are simply the ones that are on the surface of the water. In this case, it would be our empty Coke can, the piece of wood, the ping pong ball, the pumice stone, and the candle. So why do you think those items floated? We can say that the items floated because they are less dense than water. So objects that are less dense than the liquid that they are in will float. So we know that these floating items are less dense than water. The objects that sink are the bead and limestone. So when objects sink, we say they are more dense than the liquid that they are in. So in this case, the bead and the limestone are more dense than water. So density takes into um, effect the mass and the volume of an object. So if y'all remember our little experiment with the candle and the bead, the candle had more mass, it was heavier than the bead, but yet our heavy candle floated and our bead sank. So just because an object is big or just because an object is heavy doesn't mean it's automatically gonna float. So you really have to take in consideration that object's density in comparison to the liquid that it is in. Now, do you think these, these objects will float in all liquids? So that might be something you can test at home is seeing if just because an object floats in water, will it float in something else like cooking oil or will it float in salt water? So that's an experiment that you can do at home. So to do a quick review, we learned that mass is just the amount of matter that is inside an object. And you can measure and compare mass using a simple pan balance or a triple beam balance. And mass is compared or measured in grams or kilograms. We also learned that density is just the amount of matter or mass that is in a certain volume of a substance. And the mathematical way to calculate an object's density is simply mass divided by its volume. So if we look at our picture here, the boat and the bottle are floating. So that lets us know that they are less dense than the water. The tire and the rock sink, so they are more dense than the water. And I have a couple of activities for you to do at home. The first is an at-home challenge. I want to see if you can create some sort of boat with whatever materials you have at home. See if you can create a boat that can carry at least five pennies or five objects of whatever you have, see if it can float in a tub of water or a sink. Also, I want you guys to think about this reflection question. How can I find the mass and volume of the water inside my container? Also think about how can I find the mass and volume of the container itself? So think about some of the things we talked about today and some of the things Ms. Nash talked about when she was telling you guys about volume. And that is all I have for you guys today. I'm going to give it back to Mr. Broughton, and he's going to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Ramirez. There are two more questions that I wanted to get to. Um, 
Deshaun asked, is the mass I am made of affecting me day to day? And I think you meant to say matter instead of mass because you are made up of matter. Uh, and then that matter has mass. So yes, it does affect you day to day. Um, you are made up of solids, liquids, and gases. Uh, one example of a solid is your bones. And you want to have good, healthy, dense bones um, so that they don't break if you fall down. And uh, you are also made of liquids. Most of your body is actually water, but then you have blood as well. And uh, it's important to drink water every day to keep yourself hydrated since your body is mostly water. And you have gas in your body too because every time you take a breath in, that's oxygen going into your body. And that's a gas and you need that to live. And then the other question was from MC, what types of metals are most attractive? That's going back to uh, Mr. Monroe's investigation. And there are three common metals that are most attractive to a magnet. That is iron, nickel, and cobalt. Those are the three most common metals that you'll find around your home or school that are attracted to a magnet. There are some rare earth metals that are also attracted to a magnet, but um, they're more rare. So let's get to uh, our summary here. I'm going to uh, share my screen again. There we go. And today, uh, y'all discovered that matter has measure measurable physical properties, and those properties determine how matter is classified, changed, and used. So you observe solubility, uh, like uh, dissolving salt in water. We classified matter as being a solid, liquid, or gas. Uh, Mr. Ramirez investigated relative density. Some objects will float in water. Some will sink because of their relative density compared to water. Uh, we explored magnetism and conductors and insulators of electrical and thermal energy. And then the tools you saw today, um, well, more than what we have written on this slide, but you saw a beaker, a triple beam balance, and a magnet, and other tools. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, we hope you enjoyed this virtual field trip. Um, you can let us know how we did by going to www.tiny.cc slash EEC feedback and letting us know what you thought about today's trip. Um, we really enjoyed having you and look forward to seeing you again on our next one in about three weeks. So let me stop sharing my screen now and let you move on to your next period. Uh, so have a great day. Bye-bye.